So it's been a pleasure to work with Stephen, and uh, we divided this up where he would be the rah-rah pep talk for Go Team, and I would give a, an example from some of our own work that um, tells us um, by example what we could expect genomics can offer in the future to making cancer go away, which is, of course, our ultimate mission. And we've seen this, I borrowed this from Kenna, her, the pipeline of TCGA, and the part that I'm going to emphasize is some new boxes that we'd like to put in, that is, using clinical data in a, in a very direct way, uh, both the phenotype, the responses, survival, and putting that as part of the integrated computational analysis with the goal of changing clinical care, developing predictive markers of response to a drug, prognostic markers we already heard is coming out of the TCGA, and uh, then identifying new therapeutic targets. And of course, TCGA has had the requirement to get some clinical data, but this is more to actually putting the type of machine that is TCGA integral into a clinical trial, and I think that's the lesson that I'm going to drive home. Very quickly, I work for many years on diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. It's the most common type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and we can cure about half these folks, but we were unfortunately uh, left with this current situation of finding new therapies for the other half, and I was interested in figuring out who was being cured by our current therapy, and that led to a subdivision based on gene expression profiling into three large groups, the, the ABC group, activated B-cell-like, which we'll talk about a lot today, about 40 percent of cases, the GCB or germinal center, about 43 percent, and a minor subgroup, primary mediastinal lymphoma. And it certainly is the, the, the ABC tumors that have the worst uh, survival or predict the worst survival, so we're maybe curing 35 to 40 percent of these folks, but we're doing much better, not good enough, in GCB lymphoma at 75 percent. Now early on, just looking at profiles, uh, we saw a signature of NF-kappa B activity, and this signaling pathway turned out to be essential for the survival of these lymphoma cells in culture, but we didn't really know why. And what we did was turn to functional genomics, RNAi screens, and developed over the se several years the idea that it's an entire pathway leading from the B cell receptor on the cell surface to NF-kappa B with the components shown here. And the first uh, hit in our screen was a complex of signaling complex involving CARD11 malt 1 BCL10, maybe not so familiar to this audience, but really well known to immunologists. And then by resequencing in a candidate way, we found that 10 percent of the ABC tumors had mutations that explained this requirement for CAR11. That is, these mutants were constitutively active when you put them into a heterologous cell, they spontaneously turned on NF-kappa B. So that seemed to explain 10 percent of the problem. The other 90 percent uh, cases had wild-type CAR11. But we had examples in the lab where they still relied on upstream signals from the B cell receptor. In particular, if we knocked down a kinase BTK, uh, they really didn't like it. But we sequenced all the kinases in the pathway and there were no mutations. And ultimately, we, we found that it was the B cell receptor itself that when you disturbed any component of that receptor, uh, it, it, the cells died. And you could actually see this, seeing is believing, so here is an image of the B cell receptor in the membrane of the ABC lymphomas, and these bright red dots are what you see when the B cell receptor is actively signaling in microclusters, and you don't see that in other lymphoma types. Now, given this clue, we directly sequenced the, the various subunits of the B cell receptor and found in 21 percent of cases mutations that helped us understand this dependence on the B cell receptor. They occurred in two of the signaling subunits, CD79 B and A, and they affected uh, tyrosine residues that were very important for, for that signaling. Now these were not as uh, the same as the CARD11. They, I would call them backseat drivers. If you put them in a heterologous cell, nothing happens. But within the context of an ABC tumor cell, they turn up the volume on B cell receptor signaling. 
Nonetheless, genetically, this told us that this pathway was important. Now, more recently, it got complicated in an interesting way, where we came up get yet another pathway that separately leads to NF-kappa B activity, and that is driven by a signaling adapter called MIDE88. And I won't go into great detail about that, but we did find in 39% of this tumor type uh, activating mutations within one domain of MIDE 88 that spontaneously, again, in a heterologous cell will turn on NF kappa B. So if you look at this wiring diagram, uh, this makes some conclusions about where you might want to intervene therapeutically. Obviously, something in the B cell receptor pathway might be helpful, but would the MIDE 8 pathway somehow be uh, redundant in a parallel fashion, so it would compensate if I inhibited just the B cell receptor pathway. So here's a clue from cancer genetics, and it's a point that I want to drive home also at the end, that we can get information about pathways, biological pathways, simply by looking at the raw genetics and the co-occurrence or co-exclusion of mutations. So here we found that, as I mentioned about, oh, I didn't mention this, there's one point mutation in MIDE88 that is the, the most potent one. It's called L265P, and it's found in 29% of cases. So you ask, do mutant tumors with that L265P, MIDE88 mutation, do they overlap just by random with tumors that have CD79B or A? And in fact, we find not, that there's a definite statistically uh, important enrichment of those two, suggesting maybe they aren't sort of redundant leading to the same goal, but could be cooperating. So that led to a clinical trial, these kinds of findings, with a drug targeting the Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And it's a, a nice drug because it covalently modifies the protein, completely inactivates it for the duration of that protein's lifetime. And we had found that it was very potent in killing our ABC cell lines in vitro, but did not kill other lymphoma cell lines. So it had pretty good specificity. So at the NCI, with my coll colleague Wyndham Wilson, we did a short trial where we enrolled just patients with this ABC type of lymphoma and looked at 10 uh, uh, patients and uh, treated them with this drug you take once a day by mouth and it has apparently no side effects that are, that are significant for most patients. And I'll give you two vignettes uh, to show the power of this drug and something about the genetics. So this woman had ABC tumor. She had in her tumor the CD79B mutations. MIDE88 was wild type. And she had failed. This is all in relapsed refractory settings. So she had failed uh, multiple therapies and went into a complete remission by week eight. The, the arrows point to some PET positive tumors that went away at week eight. And she is our star. She's come back to see us now 2.2 years later, has no sign of disease, is taking this drug once a day by mouth, no side effects, and she's a happy camper. So we show, I'll show you the second slide here, 59-year-old woman, wild type for CD79B, no discernible genetic mutation turning on the B-cell receptor pathway. She had had a very primary refractory disease, very difficult to treat. Uh, her LDH in the blood was rapidly rising when we saw her. She had massive abdominal disease and very, went into a very good but partial remission that she stayed in for only a month, a month and a half. But during that month and a half, she felt great. So this is the story of targeted therapy, as we know. So I'll now give you a, a, a preliminary analysis but of a completed clinical trial uh, where we had 70 patients treated. Here, we took all comers, all DLBCL types, and used profiling to figure out whether they're ABC or GCB. 70 patients. And our hypothesis was ABC patients should respond better, and that's what we saw. So 41% of the tumors of the ABC type responded only 5% of the GCB. So this tells you that molecular profiling works in the context of a clinical trial. But, and oh, this just shows you more profound loss of tumor volume and uh, actually extensive sense of survival. Our patients are going out. Um, this is still, as you can see, needing more follow-up, uh, maybe heading past a year here for some of the patients. So, 
for this audience in particular, <laughs> beyond the profiling, can genetic lesions identify the responders or not? Well, sort of. So here we have the CD79B mutation. Small numbers, five out of seven of these folks responded, somewhat of an enrichment over the overall response. That's fine. But look at this very healthy response rate in tumors with wild type CD79B. So this tells you right away that you, it's not going to be as easy as the stories with the BRAF and, and, and Vemurafenib. It is not always mutation equals drug response, no mutation, uh, no drug response. This is a, a gray area and I believe a lot of what we're going to see. So then what about those MIDI88 mutant cases? Well, if you add both a MIDI88 L265P and a CD79B, you had a four out of five chance of responding in this analysis. A finding was that if you only had the MIDI88 L265P, only zero, uh, you know, four patients, but none of them responded. And then as predicted, if you had a CAR11 mutation that is downstream in the pathway and you have a drug that's upstream, no response out of four patients. Um, now, we did an, we started to do an unbiased analysis of exome sequencing within this, uh, and, and we had already noted that there was one very common lesion, which is deletion of the inc 4 a R flocus, specifically in this lymphoma type. And in red, you can see that those, even within this already bad group, are the bad tumors. It's a finding. Five out of eight patients with that had responses. Zero out of seven without that had a response. Small numbers, and, and we need to, so where am I going with all this? So a couple conclusions of how we can extend TCGA in, into this arena. First of all, I think I've learned that there's value in finding co-occurrence and co-exclusion of mutations. And I actually, if you sit down and ask your statistician to do the math, which I did yesterday, it turns out that if you want to drive this kind of analysis into the 5% and 2% range, you need 10,000 tumors. Actually, sometimes you can't even get there with 10,000 tumors. But if you want to see that 5% overlaps with 5% in a significant way, that's the number, and I think that would be a way cool project. But we, we got to come, we got to come up with, 10, it's, Ken is trying to get 500, so we got to get uh, 10,000. But I think there's real value in this genetic analysis. Second point, um, the, take a pathway-centric view of the genetic lesions. Look at both gene expression signatures, so don't forget about the phenotype, but also then use the genotype as well. And we may have to go to pathway modifications. And finally, we have to drive this to actual clinical utility. We have to make the predictive tests that are based on our genomic methods, make them available. And something that I think Barbara was the first to, to uh, put forward, the idea of a cancer genome commons where people would freely donate their cancer genome into a large database along with their response to whatever treatment they had, and then any new patient might be able to sort of dial in their genome and see where they fit. So this is, this is where we'd like to go. So, um, and, and it takes a team, it's a different team than TCGA, but it takes a team of, 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 of researchers, uh, both clinical and investigation, to pull this off. So I believe that uh, the, the kind of integrated analysis that we're going to hear about in the next two days is exactly what has to be brought into, right into NCI clinical trials, and that's one of the things we're going to be discussing uh, at NCI Central. So thanks a lot. <laughs>